Hey guys, welcome to another video. My name is Devin Adams. I'm a Fortnite instructor here in Tempe, Arizona, and I record these videos for the people who take my class. So um, I apologize for the lack of videos. Uh, I actually had my my computer crash on me and it killed my GNS3 topology here. I don't know what got corrupted or whatever, but I essentially had to put the pieces all back together. So that's why you're seeing those um, net turn boxes gone. So, cause I was troubleshooting them. And I just thought to myself, you know what? I'll put them back in once the, uh, what you call it? Once the uh, SD-WAN rule examples start coming up. But for right now, you know what? I'll just let them be. So uh, it actually turned out that I corrupted my my uh, PFSense box here. And uh, for some reason, it was just not behaving. So once I rebuilt that, everything was fine. But anyways, that was the reason for the delays. Okay, so in the last video, we created a BGP dynamic routing through the SD-WAN, all right? And uh, essentially, we're going to start building all the, the different rules together to get them all talking with each other. So, But I just got done uh, with a class, and there is one example, and it's been on my list of demos for a while now, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and do it. So, And that is essentially creating a DOS policy with the ability to automatically ban IP addresses that are doing malicious behavior. So what am I talking about here? I'm talking about the things that um, uh, we'll see, like, you know... Uh, port scans or, you know, um, maybe floods or half open SIN floods, you know, things like that. So we're going to take it a step further and instead of just um, getting alerted about it and blocking those IP addresses for a short period of time, we're going to block them for good. So, but before we can actually do the DOS policy and do it correctly, we need something to protect, okay? And so I'm going to take this opportunity to also create a DMZ, all right? And also remind people that the, the FortiGate can do web application firewall. So that is a specific application space uh, that protects web servers, okay? Uh, input validation, and of course, you know, if you need like um, a dedicated appliance, there's always the what you call it, the 40 web, right? So, uh, but you know what? We'll just do that real real quickly. So, and then maybe in the later videos, I'll, I'll clean up the Forti Manager and stick one of its interfaces in there too, because really, really that should be isolated behind a DOS policy also. Anyways, so uh, I'm just going to go ahead and, and get right to it though. All right, guys? So essentially, we're going to create a web server that's going to be publicly facing. So I'm just going to use one of the switches from GNS3 here, so, um, because you know what, there's not going to be a lot of traffic going through it, so I don't really need an open vSwitch. Here we go. All right, and I'm just going to say uh, 172.16.10/24dmz is going to be the name. All right. And uh, let's see what ports we have free on the FortiGate. I can't even remember. We'll have uh, the DMZ to be on port 10. Okay. So, not too bad. It's getting way too crowded in here. Anyways. And then we already have a web server appliance here. Now, I am just using the, um, I am just using the toolbox that comes with GNS3. It, it, acts as a web server you can put on your own web pages i'm going to duplicate this bad boy though because it's already just the way i want it to be in the terms of the way it looks and how it operates and we made that in an earlier video but this this guy here was supposed to represent like a intranet server some kind of internal resource and we'll get that vpn running here one of these days shortly but here's our web server it's publicly facing and we want to go ahead and and protect it to some degree now obviously this is going to be a superficial example but um might as well have it there just so we can play around with it so here we go let's go ahead and configure it and put a different ip address on it all right and uh obviously it needs to be in the same ip address range as the dmz so there we go and then we'll do the default gateway once we get it configured on the FortiGate. So, and that'll be 254. And we'll just use, uh, we don't need to use our domain controller. We'll just borrow Google's DNS. Thank you, Google. All right, there we go. Okay. Hit apply, hit okay. Plug that bad boy in. 
All right, not too bad, and we'll turn it on. Okay, so now we have something to protect. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, do it on the FortiGate. So let's open up our domain controller. Normally we don't work on the domain controller, but I didn't want multiple Windows machines here. And let's see if I can't get to our, our FortiGate. All right, there it is, let's log in. Okay, and I made port 10 the DMZ. So I'm gonna go to my uh, network. I'm gonna go to interfaces. All right, there's our rockin' SD-WAN. I'm gonna say create new interface. Why am I creating a new interface? I don't need to create a new interface. What am I doing, guys? I just need to open up our physical interfaces. Go to port 10. All right. Now, I've actually never used the role DMZ. Now, the whole point of the DMZ, okay, is supposed to be uh, us hiding settings that might not be in relative from, you know, from, um, <laughs> from hiding settings that we might not apply to something that would be normally in the DMZ, okay? Like, if you notice here, there's no DHCP server and stuff like that. So, um, but you know what? Just for giggles, I'm going to try it. So. I'll still call it DMZ. All right, and then here we go. 172.16.1.254. Okay, uh, sure, why not? You never know. Even though I hate that, I hate that name. You know what? I'll make that myself later. And just for the sake of connectivity and to test connectivity, I'll, I'll do ping access. Okay, so, and why not? device detection because we'll use that later on okay all right not too bad there okay now what else do we need so we created the DMZ uh, let's go ahead and create a VIP which is a virtual IP address that will NAT from the outside in and also um, which I'm trying to think of like which IP address should we use I guess we can use something from our main port one now, normally, you know, if you wanted multiple IP addresses, you'd have to think about routing and and maybe even BGP if you wanted to to have some kind of like you know fault tolerance of getting to a resource if one internet service provider goes down. And I'm talking way too much into it. So, anyways, let's go ahead and create the virtual IP address. So, uh, we'll go over to our policy and objects. All right. Uh, we'll go to virtual IPs, and we do already have one for the Florida manager, right? So the Florida manager can have outside access. Okay, this one is going to be web server, and I'll do DMZ just to, you know, distinguish it from our internal one. I don't know, but we'll say outside is going to be 10, 200, 1, uh, I don't know, guys, 1, 2, 3, okay? Looks clever enough to me, and it'll be 172, 16, 1. 10 will be the IP address. All right. There we go. Why did I stop like using my colors? It's in the DMZ, so I'm going to make it a uh, orange or something. I don't know. There we go. That looks that looks party. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, now nothing happens without a firewall policy, okay? Now 62 the biggest in my opinion, leap that it made from 6.0 was the ability to do the um, inspection mode based off of the firewall policy instead of the VDOM or the entire FortiGate. So even though the rest of our FortiGate is doing flow-based uh, inspection, uh, the web application firewall, which is there specifically just to protect web servers, right? that is actually uh, a proxy-only inspection uh, feature. But now we don't have to choose between the two. We can do it per firewall policy. So I'm just going to make sure that it is on in the feature visibility so I can use it. So I'm going to come over here to my uh, feature visibility. All right. And if you notice here, web application firewall is turned off by default. So let's go ahead and turn it on. And it should now be an option when we're doing our configuration. All right. So not too bad. Now we got to write the firewall policy to make it happen. All right, so we'll go to IP4, and we'll say new, and we'll say uh, web server DMZ, okay? Now, I have not created anything other than a map to port 1, so I'm just going to say port 1, okay? Our outgoing interface is going to be DMZ, 
So it's coming from the internet to the DMZ. Here we could actually put in like a, a country code or something like that to protect it. For right now, I'm just going to say all, but our destination is going to be our web server. Okay. So, and then services. Now, normally we would only do HTTP, HTTPS because it's a web server. Okay. Now, I don't have the tools set up to do any more sophisticated of probing other than other than like a ping flood right now because I'm kind of doing this on the fly okay if I if I go ahead and I, I do a more sophisticated one or maybe I'll do like a uh, you know a port scanner or something later on but for right now I'm also going to allow ICMP traffic through okay so normally I probably wouldn't do that but I'm going to say proxy based all right and NAT is turned off and the reason why NAT is turned off because we're actually doing NAT through the VIP okay so but now we have web application firewall that will protect the firewall now I do not have HTTPS configured but if I did have a web server app I would upload the key pair to my web server so I can inspect encrypted traffic to our web server we don't have to do a man in the middle if it's our own server Maybe I'll do a video on that later down the road also. But for right now, we're saying we're protecting our web application firewall. And let's take a look at what that actually does. Okay, so cross-site scripting attacks, SQL injection, generic attacks. And, and all of these are very specific to, to our, what you call it, to our web server. Okay, now, of course, there's a little bit more into it than that. You know what I mean? You're going to you're going to want to go ahead and do the things that are more specific to you and also read which one of these vulnerabilities are exactly relative. But for right now, I just wanted to take advantage of that and show it here on online to say, hey, you know what? The FortiGate can do that. OK, so there we go. All right. And now all we have to do is really test it. So let's go and see if our web server is accessible from the outside world. OK. Um, OK, let's do it. So let's go over to our uh, PC over here in New York. Right. And I'm just going to go to uh, 10, 200, 1, 1, 2, 3. All right. And if everything happened all right, it should find its way to, to the DMZ. Or not. You know, that's cool, too. Of course it didn't work. Do we have it turned on? Yeah, we have it turned on. All right. No, that should have worked. All right, all right. Let's see what's going on here. All right, sorry about that, guys. Hey, it would be nice if I plugged it into the switch and not directly into the FortiGate. So yeah, that's what happened. I, I just hit pause on the video. I'm all staring. I'm like, okay, seriously? And I stood here for a minute, and then I pinged from here. I pinged from here. Nothing, nothing. I'm like, really? And then I realized I had a cabling problem. Yay! Anyways, as you can see, we have our web server. All is right with the world. All right? Cool. And also, let's go ahead and just test it. Now, like I said, normally web servers probably wouldn't be pingable unless we wanted that by design. Um, but we're able to ping it. Okay. So it's, it's working. All right. Now this is true about um, anything that's in a, a, a resource that's publicly facing. All right. Our DOS policies are there to, to protect them. All right. Now, if it is uh if it is like a uh, malicious IP address that's sending too much traffic or sending half open connections or trying to probe it, those are the things that we're going to want to protect. And I've had more than one person ask me, is there a way to go ahead and automate banning that IP address? And I've actually done videos before about uh, protecting the DMZ and also doing like country code blocking and also block lists that, that can rest on top of like a, a DMZ. Here, we're going to write a DOS policy to auto ban IP addresses that are acting wonky, all right? So that are doing malicious behavior. So let's go ahead and, and do that, okay? So uh, let's go back into our domain controller, all right? Uh, wherever it is, here we go. All right, 
so this is working just the way that we wanted to okay but now we're gonna go ahead and create a DOS policy and that does have a separate policy right here we're gonna say new and if you notice here it's just an incoming interface so that is going to be port 1 okay because port 1 is the WAN address that it's coming in through all right guys so source address the internet's a big place right now maybe everyone's on our cool list our destination now normally uh, our VIP object would be here all right but if you notice there is no VIP object I'm gonna have to look up maybe how to do that more more specifically I don't know if it'd be like the internal NAT address but for right now I'm gonna say anything coming into port 1 specifically it's gonna be our our DMZ but that's also gonna qualify all right um, Anyways, so, and then services here are obviously just the services that, uh, that need the access. So I think I hit okay too many times. So once again, guys, the destination would be just our, um, would just be our, our VIP addresses. Okay. I just don't, don't know off the top of my head because this happened last time I was trying to make a DOS policy. I'm not seeing uh, a VIP address, so I'm going to have to read up on that. Okay, but more importantly, though, is this stuff down here. All right, guys, so if you notice, we have layers three, layers four. And so this is saying, and normally, like I said, this would just be a, a web servers or things that we're trying to protect. But this normally says, you know, um, if too many sessions are coming from a single source, go ahead, log it, block it. All right. Same thing with destination. If we have too many sources going to one of our servers, all right, we can go ahead and block it. Right. And this will actually protect us against DOS attacks. OK, because normally, like I said, we only have to write a DOS policy for things that we would normally allow through the firewall. OK, now the thresholds and everything like that, guys, they do say that the best practice is going to be to know your baseline because the last thing you want is to start blocking legitimate traffic okay so I actually suggest if you are going to do the auto banning make sure you have a pretty good threshold of what normal traffic looks like okay and also maybe set it just a little bit higher for the auto banning all right so anyways all right same thing here this should all be pretty pretty straightforward right guys so source is a traditional DOS attack where one person is, is sending us too much traffic or or malicious traffic whereas destination is like a distributed denial of service attack so we'll do the ICMP sessions we'll do the sweep and the floods okay we can even do the uh, half open sins uh, even just normal sessions all right whatever you guys want to do it's gonna be up to how how much you want to how much you want to uh, enforce all right just make sure once again do not DOS attack your own business okay so and uh, just because I'm a lab environment and I don't well maybe that's fast enough all right because these threshold timers are actually way more granular um, within the the CLI which I'll show you guys here here shortly okay so because uh, the whole point is to automatically ban them Okay, so here we go. So we now have a DOS policy in place. Okay, and just to show you, I mean, it's it's uh, not a big deal if it's coming through and acting in normal thresholds. Like if I just ping 10.200.1.123, I mean, we're we're sending it at a very slow rate. Legitimately, everything's okay. All right. It's really when someone starts flooding us with this traffic that we want to we want to automatically ban it. All right. Or maybe they're sweeping a range within our subnet or if they're probing a particular device for open ports. All right. So anyways, I will put up in the comments field the um, documentation page on where to find these settings so you guys can have them later on. But we're going to right click here and say edit in the CLI. All right. And this is the command. 
as you can see, we have our port scans coming from, going to, and our thresholds, all right? Now, don't forget that you can always do a get to see all of the options. And for here, I'm actually going to do um, the ICMP flood, all right? So I'm going to automatically block people and put them on a quarantine list that's good for a year, all right, um, if they're if they're pinging us too much. So our next step here is going to be edit, uh, or sorry, config, my bad, config, anomaly, edit, and it's going to be ICMP flood. And then this is what I mean by the show is what we've configured, but the git will show you the thresholds, all right? So it's on, and you guys see there where it says quarantine is none? That is what we are going to um, manipulate. So are you guys ready? We're going to do a uh, set quarantine to the attacker. So when someone's deemed an attacker, they'll go ahead and do that. And there's even a couple of more options here that's not even being showed when you do the get, but it is in the documentation. All right. And that's going to be, okay, uh, the quarantine um, uh, expiration, because we want to, in theory, automatically ban these people. Now, normally it's five minutes. All right. And that should give us enough time to, like, you know, have some kind of auto bat bot to give up, maybe. But here we're going to just automatically put them on a quarantine list until until we manually take them off. So let's do a set, quarantine, expiry to, are you guys ready? It's gonna be, uh, the maximum is 364 days, all right, uh, 23 hours, <laughs> and uh, 59 minutes. Yeah, and then set quarantine log to enable. That way we can see who who's in quarantine, who's been a who's been banned all right and then hopefully if everything works okay it should automatically automatically ban those ip addresses for a year essentially you know for a good long time at least a year for me is is considered almost automatic okay um so we don't have to like you know manually go ahead and do it okay so let's go ahead and test it and like i said um, I just did the pinging, so it would be a lot easier to to be able to to test. So I'm going to do the minus F, right? So I can flood it with IP addresses. I mean, with uh, ping packets. Two hundred one dot one two three. Okay. So it is now bombarding that poor DMZ with pings. Okay. So is it getting through? What's going on here? Well, let's let's go ahead and check it out. So, for starters, we should at least get an alert about it because we did have logging turned on. So let's check it out. Are you guys ready? So let's go over to our um, uh, let's see here, our log and reports, and let's go to anomaly. And if you noticed here, guys, all right, we do have an IP address that was trying to to get there okay because of natting that's the public ip address that was being used all right um so it worked okay now don't forget though we do have sd wan here so i'm gonna go ahead and, and see if it really quarantined it um but then again it could actually switch the the ip address on me so um anyways but let's go down to our um uh let's see here let me I'm not seeing any any quarantine. So let me let me refresh it, okay? I mean like my whole GUI. Here we go. Cuz eventually we should see quarantining and that's actually going to be underneath monitor. All right? There we go. And as you can see that IP address has now automatically been banned and it'll do that for the probing, the sweeping, whatever we set it to. But please, once again, guys, just know your thresholds before you do this. Do not, do not DOS attack yourselves, okay? So anyways, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, thank goodness for the SD-WAN. I can go ahead and actually just unplug the cable I don't want. 
All right, so uh, let's see here. I'm going to do number five. There we go. All right, so the only one that's left is uh, the one nine, the ten two hundred six one from here to here. Okay, um, but if you notice, and we can we can stop now, buddy. If I go out to like Facebook or something like that, I mean, I'm still on the internet, right? And I'm actually just going to, for the sake of, um, for the sake of uh, testing, I'm going to go ahead and clear out all the history and all the cache, all right? Because the last thing I want is is that uh, internal server or whatever or the web server to be buffered so let's go to 10.200.1.123 and as you can see wow i didn't even know i didn't even know it had a block page that's cool <laughs> okay so as you can tell i mean they're not getting to our system again all right so and we can also see this by just doing a normal ping I mean nothing. They're they're on our poo-poo list. So anyways guys, so there you go. There's there's a quick video for you. So once again, right? Um that is how we essentially block our IP addresses automatically using a, a DOS policy. Okay? So now if you need any other vulnerability that's more specific, that's obviously what the web application firewall is for. All right? And uh, that one has actual protections against the web server itself, okay? Uh, you can even slap on a normal IPS policy, too, that even has more um, vulnerability scannings and, and vulnerability exploit scannings and things like that. Uh, so the firewalls can do, do quite a bit. So, all right, I hope someone found that helpful. Okay, guys, I know this video is long, but it was so bugging me, and I had to just make sure because I should have just had that done beforehand. So uh, once again, just backing up real quick with the, um, I, I'm not a YouTuber, guys. I apologize. Anyways, but backing up with the whole uh, DOS policy, okay? So the DOS policy actually happens and it gets evaluated before any of the internal firewall policies. That's why you're only seeing one interface here being evaluated okay so any kind of like VIP or any kind of natting that would happen would happen deeper within the uh, processing of a packet and you can look this all up um, it is called life of a packet or parallel processing on the FortiGates uh, uh, documentation on Fortinet's website okay and uh, that's why for the destination address I was telling you guys oh I can't remember what exactly I have to put here if it was the internal or the external of course it's the external so I went ahead and I just made a address object specifically just for the public IP address that uh, would match for our web server in our DMZ all right and if I was protecting if I was protecting like the Florida manager in the same way I would go ahead and I'd include all the um, IP addresses that were publicly facing for the Florida manager that was coming into port one. So any of your servers that you're trying to protect, you're just going to make a normal IP object with the publicly facing IP address. The VIP object that actually allowed it to happen, that happens in the IP4 policies. All right. So because honestly, we only need to protect the things in a DOS policy. Okay. Uh, that would normally get through because everything gets blocked anyways without the firewall policy all right so the whole point here is just you know giving people a chance okay so um don't leave that to all <laughs> you know you don't you don't need to then again i guess i guess it wouldn't hurt anything because it wouldn't make it through the next step but at least you could catch it here all right so and also guys if someone does get blocked as you can see here when we go to our monitor and we go to our um, quarantine monitor right and let's say you know they called this up and they're all like oh you know I'm trying to get to your web page but I'm blocked you can look up the log files you can say you know what IP address was hitting it or something was was attacking us by your public IP address you know and they can go ahead and give their justification uh, but bottom line is that you know when they're ready to 
to be removed, all you have to do is hit the delete and take them off. And then right away they should be able to, to get back through. All right. So, all right, guys. So there you go. There's another video. Wasn't the greatest. I'm sorry. So, um, and the next couple of videos that are coming up, once again, is going to be doing more with the security fabric and the SD-WAN. Also, I got a whole bunch of SSL VPN uh, examples that I got to do, especially when it comes to a Windows environment. Uh, hopefully, I can get those done in the next week or so. Other than that, you guys uh, have a great day. For all those with mothers out there, happy Mother's Day. All right. Or whoever is a mom watching this. Okay. Happy Mother's Day. And uh, I'll see you guys on the beach. I'll see you later. Bye.